Welcome, everyone. I am Dr. Lauren Cross, Assistant Professor of Interdisciplinary Art and Design Studies here in the College of Visual Arts and Design. I want to thank you all for attending our first installment of the 2044 series, where we are engaging ongoing conversations about anti-racist pedagogy in the arts and design. For our panels this year, we are looking specifically at issues of anti-Black racism and exploring Afrofuturism and critical race theory as essential tools for our work. We wanna thank the Onstead Institute for Education and the Visual Arts and Design and the College of Visual Arts and Design at UNT, um, who are our host sponsors for our series. And we also wanna thank our co-sponsors as well, the College of Education, the College of Information, UNT's Division of Institutional Equity and Diversity, UNT's Multicultural Center, the Texas Academy of Mathematics and Science, and the Honors College. Again, we are so excited to have you with us today, and we look forward to an engaging conversation with our distinguished guest panelists. Just to remind you that this session, we are exploring anti-racist pedagogy in K-12 through art education and in higher education. As a bit of housekeeping, we ask that you post your questions in the Q&A as we proceed, and the chat feature is disabled for security reasons. We will address your questions during the Q&A portion of our program. Our conversation is built around four guiding questions, which my colleague, Dr. Kathy Brown, will discuss, as well as the introduction of our guest panelists for today. Dr. Brown? Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brown. I'm assistant professor of art education here at the University of North Texas. And Lauren and I, along with the Onstead Institute, are so glad that you all have joined us. So first, I'd like to show you guys and share with you our guiding questions, our framing questions for the day. All right. So our four questions are uh, describe your work and how it relates to Afrofuturism and for futurist thinking. Uh, in addition to what is the role of art education in, in the perpetuation of anti-Blackness and or the systems of white supremacy? How can K-12 art educators engage in anti-racist art pedagogy? And how can art educators in higher ed engage in art pedagogy, anti-racist art pedagogy? And the last question will be, based on your scholarship, pedagogy, and positions in the field, how do you foresee the future of art education as an anti-racist institution or discipline? So we're going to ask these questions of the, our esteemed scholars as we go along in our talk today. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce them, because we are, I am fanning out myself, because I am a huge fan of both of these giants in the field. Dr. Joni Boyd Acuff. I'm going to read a bit of her fantastic, impressive bio. So she is currently a professor of art education at the Ohio State University. She serves as graduate studies chair and, and diversity chair in the Department of Arts Administration, Education and Policy, where she has a goal of recruiting, admitting and retaining students from diverse backgrounds. She teaches undergraduate and graduate courses such as critical analysis of multicultural art education, social and cultural theory in art and art education, critical pedagogies of critical multiculturalism in teaching visual culture. She also is, she utilizes frameworks such as critical multiculturalism, critical race theory, black feminist thought and Afrofuturism to develop pedagogy, pedagogical and curriculum strategies for art education. Again, a prolific scholar, her most recent publication, one of her most recent publications is Afrofuturism, Reimagining Art Curriculum for Black Existence in an issue of Art Education Journal. Visuality of Race and Popular Culture, Teaching Racial Histor Histories and Iconography in Media. She also co-authored a book with our own Dr. Laura Evans entitled Multiculturalism in the Museum Today. She, her newest book is Race and Art Education, published alongside her co-author, Dr. Amy, Craig, Amy M. Craig. Moreover, she is the recipient of the 2017 Mary J. Rouse Early Career Award, and in 2019, the J. Eugene Grisby Award for her culturally engaged research. And most recently, she's received a high honor, in addition to all her other high honors, of being the 2020 Manuel Barkin Award winner for scholarly merit. 
All of these awards come from the National Art Education Association, the foremost leading professional organization in the field. She received her bachelor's degrees, two bachelor's degrees from Penn State and her PhD from The Ohio State. The work that she's doing now began with her critical dissertation entitled The Multicultural and Social Reconstructivist Approach to Art Education, a Framework for Social Justice Through Art Curriculum, where she investigated the influences of social justice curriculum in a community center for youth who identifies LGBTQ. Moreover, she is a sought after speaker and she has had many media appearances and interviews. We thank her for joining us. Our next esteemed panelist is Dr. James Hayward Rollin. He is a full professor of art education at Syracuse University and also the program director for art education. And in March, he will begin his tenure as the 37th president of the National Art Education Association. In addition to that, he penned an iconic Black Lives Matter open letter to the NAEA Art Education Journal in 2020. In addition to these important roles, Dr. Rollins is also a visual artist, a writer, and now a TV consultant. His bio states that he is having a good time these days, working as a main script consultant for a new children's television show being piloted by Jim, the Jim Henson Company for PBS aimed at introducing kids to their own creative superpowers by learning through the arts. But what thrills him the most is he is about to publish an inspirational coming of age memoir that traces his upbringing as a painfully shy child raised in a struggling inner city New York neighborhood. A candid self-portrait of a black boy often reprimanded for daydreaming, daydreaming too much, who grew up to become an artist, an art teacher, a scholar, and a leader in his field. He received his doctorate in education from Columbia University's Teachers College and received his art education teacher certification from the state of New York. Lastly, his areas of interest, his research areas of interest and his expertise lie in art and design education, creative leadership, arts-based and narrative research methods, social justice and urban education, visual culture and identity politics, and community engaged scholarships, among many other things. Thank you to our esteemed panelists for joining us. We're going to go right into our questions because we know we want to hear from them and they're going to explain their work further. To the panelists, describe your work and how it relates to Afrofuturism or futurist thinking. Actually, so let me start off by saying that um, uh, for me, uh, in terms of describing my work, let's start with Afrofuturism. And, and I'm going to... Uh, since this is the, the first in a series, I figured it's a good place to start. Uh, and um, as the series goes on, and uh, not just today, but also the following days, it'll just be uh, as, as an audience checks back in for those other sessions. I'm sure it'll get reaffirmed as we go forward. But I, but I just to start off with this idea that Afrofuturism co-ops stories. I'm going to give you an example. This is a zombie movie, a zombie apocalypse film that I absolutely love. I've watched it actually two times actually within this week on HBO. And it sucks me right in every time. It's called The Girl with All the Gifts. Now in the book, which is originally written by uh, M.R. Carey, the character, um, uh, a character named Melanie is a nine-year-old white girl who goes to school, has friends, loves books. She's got a blazing intelligence. Um, is obviously gifted, and, and we discover she lives underground in an army base with about 20 or so other kids her age. Um, the weird thing is that she's muzzled occasionally. She's chained to her desk, but she adores her teacher, nevertheless. As, uh, in the book, the teacher's name is a black woman named Helen Justino. All the classes are tests to sort of like see what kind of information the kids can retain and understand, except that with Miss Justino, she reads stories to the kids. And like um, some of you have heard the, the quote from Bruno Bettelheim, stories are the food of the young. Melanie eats that up. Um, but it, it, shortly after the book begins, you realize that Melanie is not everything that she appears to be. Because once she gets uh, a whiff of human flesh, she uh, turns into this savage uh, man-eating monster. Um, and uh, we learn in the book that 
she, uh, like the other children that are kept in this facility, are actually zombies. And that the planet has been overrun by fungal contagion that turns most people into zombies. And these kids who were born during the contagion ate their way out of the mother's wombs and are not really human, not really fully zombie. Um, now, the reason why I say all of this is because I said Afrofuturism co-op stories. The film, which is unlike the book, does uh, a little flip. Um, Melanie is no longer a white girl. Um, there's a swap of races that takes place. And Miss Just Know uh, becomes white and Melanie becomes black in a way that makes race matter in the film that it didn't really matter in the original story. Reinterpreting Melanie as the lead character and making uh, the way that she throws off her cages and her shackles and actually forces her abusers to value her life in a way that matters to the audience like long after the film is over. Um, that brings me back to that definition of Afrofuturism uh, Afro and its relation to my work. So I'm gonna give you two quotes um, to start off with uh, and then before I pass things on to my esteemed colleague. Um, there is a, a, and I'll read bits of it. For the, the, the term Afrofuturism futurism was coined in 1993. Um, but it's actually been a, an impulse that's been around and, a, and, a, and a, a movement that's been around since the 50s. It's this type of reimagining of our past and our present and our future as Africans or African-Americans by combining traditional culture with futuristic elements. Um, there's another quote that I want to share, um, which uh, talks about uh, Afrofuturism, whether it appears in novels or films, like I just mentioned, or music, imagining a world where the African diaspora and sci-fi intersect. Um, the term was first coined by a writer named Mike Derry. Um, you've seen uh, elements of Afrofuturism most famously recently in Black Panther. Um, but that's where I wanna sort of make the conversation, take the conversation in a slightly different direction. Because I wanna make the argument that um, Afrofuturist narratives also harbor um, significant implications for anti-racist pedagogies. Now, why is that so? Um, I want to suggest that uh, it's part of it is the proliferation of new stories, new stories of origin, um, because the pretenses of uh, hegemony, homogen homogeneity, colorblindness, melting pots have always served as a really dangerous masking agent to hiding the fact that there are superheroes amongst us, young, gifted, and black. They're born every day, dwelling throughout the African diaspora. And racism masks really truly lived experiences. Um, it becomes like a, 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 a filter that, that uh, it's, it's difficult to know how to remove as we've all seen recently in a popular um, uh, meme that's been going around. Um, but the, the other thing that I wanna say uh, is that racism, if nothing else, tends to overrepresent over the African or African-American identity um, but in the form of a distortion or an anomaly or a kind of negative space against which you posit white supremacy. Um, so my work as an art educator, I've always um, focused on this idea, whether I'm working with kids or with um, adults, on this idea of developing new creative leaders. Um, when I work with kids in, in, in elementary school classrooms, I look at them as in terms of the stories that they have and they want to tell and that have oftentimes been masked. Um, I, 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 you know, and to, and to my mind, it doesn't matter how ugly the beginning may have been, um, no matter what stories uh, we are talking about in terms of the past, um, we have this ability when you look at what storytelling can do, especially when you're looking at it through this lens of, of taking what was, um, uh, was what, what meant one thing and reinterpreting it and then casting it back into the popular culture, right? Um, so, um, uh, and the last bit in terms of how it connect, this all connects with my, my work. Um, I once uh, wrote an article um, with a colleague of mine uh, at Syracuse University, uh, Dr. Shreve Bay. Um, and in it, I shared this uh, quote, that under the crushing weight of centuries of representations, representations like the stereotypes I showed a couple of slides ago, managing stigma would be difficult to imagine if not for the protein quality of stories that we live by. No matter how entrenched the stereotype becomes, 
across any narrative archetype, there will inevitably, inevitably be shifts in imagery and meaning that take place over time. Um, and that actually can be very rapid, um, uh, catalyzing, like um, when the film Black Panther came out. Um, and whether identity is mediated through these evolving self def definitions or more broadly through mass media narratives or uh, uh, nonetheless, these become thresholds for annexing neighboring identity positions and, and reconfiguring, reconfiguring life worlds. That's an example of my scholarship in the sense that uh, uh, the, the notion in the sense that uh, stories have always uh, presented themselves as something that can be reinterpreted and that's heightened, especially through the Afrofuturist lens. So I'll stop there. Um, but that's basically how I describe my work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rowling, for um, that great setup. I really um, appreciate the idea about Af Afrofuturism co-opting stories. Um, and just by the way, I'm glad the visual is up because I wore my Basquiat sweatshirt just for the occasion. So i um, excited about sharing that. Shout out to Target. They've been having some really strong black centric um, apparel. So check it out. Um, but yeah, thank you, Dr. Rowling, for that. Um, so my answer to this question about how my work relates to Afrofuturism. Um, I just have one slide um, and my, my role is building capacity to amplify past future visions. And I'll talk a little bit about capacity, but first I wanted to um, just revert back to the article that I wrote about Afrofuturism in which I talk about the ways that it can help reimagine art discourses and uh, produce, produce these counter practices that help us decenter whiteness and also transform the ways that black students in specifically can see themselves in the future, in the world, in the art world, um, just at writ large. And so speaking again to what uh, Dr. Rowling already kind of set up, but Mark Derry's primary conceptualization of Afrofuturism situated around um, science fiction and technology, but really giving us a way to a frame to think about just uh, black people in general for for futures. Um, and I wanted to. Uh, share this specific quote that I feel like um, helps me talk about the building my capacity, um, help, helping me build capacity for this work. Um, in his theorizing of Afrofuturism, Derry questioned the possibility of black of the black community even being able to imagine futures because of the intentional mass elimination of their past by Northern white Europeans. Derry explains, the historical reason that we've been so impoverished in terms of future images is because until fairly recently, as a people, we were systema systematically forbidden any images of our past. I have no idea where in Africa my ans Black ancestors came from because when they reached the slave markets of New Orleans, records of such things were systemically destroyed. And then later he goes on to eventually come to the assertion that yes, Black people do have legitimate stories to tell about culture, technology, and what's to come for the future, but it has to be built on like these myths, these, these ideas that we can create and imagine on our own. And so I believe in order for this to happen that we have to build capacity. So that's where I, that's where my work is. We need to build a movement of our educators who have this foundational knowledge. Um, they have the ide ideological buy-in to support the re this uh, specific type of reimagining. That means they have to be have racial literacy. Um, they have to have a racial consciousness practice. So I, I feel like my work is futuristic in that everything that I do from my research, my teaching, my writing, um, my recent collective movement building, um, it needs to focus, it has had a focus on developing future art educators, teaching practices such that they can support learners in developing visual understandings of race in the world. Um, uh, Dr. Rowling, you spoke about um, making race um, matter. Yeah, making race matter. So that's that's where I um, feel like my role is in this in this frame, informing educators on how to be race conscious and how to help their students be race conscious and what that looks like. A lot of my work is practice based. It's really um, telling you what this might look like. 
and what your responsibility is as an educator. A deeper awareness of visual codes and conventions is necessary. Um, they can foster these these conventions. These understandings can foster critical interpretations and creative responses to popular racial constructions that we see on a day to day basis every you know every day. Um, without knowing how to read racial events, you can't understand how to use how the use of certain ideologies, strategies, and language is really reproducing harm to our Black students and other students of color. The conventions that we accept and and have held so true as a true to as a field um, have to be identified as problematic in order to not reuse them in our attempts to support future visions. Um, so Amy and I, uh, Amy Cray, Dr. Amy Cray, who is at um, in Arizona University of Arizona, uh, we have a book coming out, Race and Art Education, published through the Davis Art Education and Practice Series. But we advocate for an ecological approach to understanding the impact of race and racism in the lives of students. So this means like. Um, it can be tempting for uh, our art teachers to want to focus solely on what happens inside the classroom. But an ecological approach means we need to view art learning not in isolation, but instead as a reciprocal interaction between what happens with learners in art classrooms and the dynamics taking place in the broader biological, ideological, and economic environment. And this is, enables art teachers to understand how they and their students and the students that they teach are a part of a larger network um, or a web-like system of relationships that produce racial inequities. So um, the practice of art education is not separate from its context. Like all aspects of schooling, art education is intertwined with this wider social, cultural, economic, and um, political dynamic. So my, my role is to, um, my role is to support these foundational things that um, are required in order the, the, the basis for building a future. Ha you have to have some type of um, cognizance and racial literacy to, um, to not re reinforce and reaffirm what has um, largely harmed uh, black and brown people in the past in the arts. Thank you so much. I, I mean, that was just so powerful. Um, I, I'm, I'm jotting down notes as, as you all are going on. So I appreciate that. Um, so my question is, what is the role of art education in, perpetu in the preparation of perpetuation, sorry, of anti-Blackness and or white supremacist systems? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. A. Cuff. Um, actually, you forecast some of the things I want to sort of touch on in response to this question. Um, so uh, this past summer, um, I wrote a, uh, an open letter to arts educators and frankly, creatives in any field. And, it's, and frankly, I'm happy that it's gone, gone beyond arts educators. And I, it, it, um, it was just, uh, talking about the theme, the, the idea that black lives matter. And this is um, something that's uh, divorced from the organization, Black Lives Matter. It's, it's the idea that every time uh, 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 someone who has, um, who's a part of the African diaspora, um, every time one of us asserts the fact that my life matters, um, that's, a, that's a, an echo of that, um, that effort to rewrite the story, the change that protein nature or story is that, that I mentioned, um, to change the script, to flip the script in terms of what's been written for centuries about our lives and uh, essentially saying that our lives don't matter. So um, at the start of the letter, um, I um, argue that the term systemic racism is redundant. And that might seem like an odd thing to say, but um, actually, I, I, and I want to go start here because of actually one of the questions that I saw listed in the chat um, uh, about the fact that there are certain scholars out there that argue that uh, systemic racism doesn't exist. And I would argue that um, these are folks who don't understand systems um, and don't understand that. Um, so I'm going to start with a, uh, the work of a, a systems expert, um, very well known. Uh, Departed this world too soon, 
Donella Meadows, who wrote uh, very simply, right? A system is a set of things. It could be a set of people, set of cells, set of molecules, whatever, um, that are interconnected in such a way that they produce their own pattern of behavior over time. So that's why when you look at any society, it's systemic. Um, every, the fact that every society looks different is because systemically, those people, the stories, their lives, identities, their environment, uh, work in a way that, that makes it distinct. Um, and I'm gonna argue also, uh, and, I, and I have argued that racism just by itself is systemic. That's his very nature. It doesn't require a grammatical modifier. You don't need to say systemic racism. And when you do that, once you understand what racism actually is, you realize that it's not um, about, I don't like you, right? Um, I, I hate you. Uh, that's a, that's a, that th those kinds of feelings and um, stances are a byproduct of racism, but it's not what racism is in itself. It's a system. Right. So and that uh, alleviates us from attacking the Archie Bunkers. Right. Rather than what produced the Archie Bunkers of the world. Uh, every system produces structures and behaviors uh, that perpetuate that system. Um, it's the, the reproductive nature of systems um, to maintain their distinctness in the world. So racist systems produce racist individuals and racist institutions and racist policies as a necessary byproduct. Um, not the other way around. It's not racist people that produce uh, racist systems. It's racist systems that produce racist thinking, right? So, um, uh, these, so these are all byproducts. And, and once you understand the way systems work, you realize that you can actually intervene in the way syst a system works. Uh, and and uh, a good example of that is the way a virus works, to be honest with you. Um, and that um, what functions in, in terms of our normal bodily systems get co-opted by a virus that makes those systems do things and that they're not supposed to do, right? And sometimes that can be uh, deadly, right? But the point is that interventions can also improve upon a system. So uh, I wanna sort of cut through to the idea, back to answering the question, um, public education is a part of the system, uh, is one of the systems that, uh, that uh, um, that our nation uh, uses to, to educate its own. Um, public and private education is a national institution. So if you have an institution that's a part of a racist society or where racism has um, uh, had its way in terms of shaping some of our uh, 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 many or maybe arguably uh, all of our institutions over the past centuries, um, those institutions are gonna show racist outcomes. And um, for that, uh, uh, you know, that, that gets to the notion that um, uh, whether you're, and, and we can look at it in terms of the history of segregation, um, barricading equal opportunity in schools, uh, 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 government run boarding schools, the whitewashing the culture of indigenous children, gerrymandered school districts and the preservation of white community tax bases and wealth legacies high stakes standardized testing and discriminatory practices in terms of tracking students of color away from college prep um, and towards more low wage job uh, opportunities, uh, over policed schools and higher rates of detention uh, amongst students of color. All of these are byproducts of the fact that we have a, a, an educational system that is a part of our racist legacy in this nation. Um, so, uh, I'll say this to, to conclude all of this. Um, you asked the question, what is the role of art education in perpetuating anti-blackness and white supremacist systems? And I would say that any professional practice or any organization that is not actively anti-racist is complicit with the outcomes of a society that has long institutionalized its racism. Um, and I'll stop there. Okay. Um, all right, so thanks. Thanks, Dr. Rowling. Um, I'm so glad I come after you because I'm just so inspired by <laughs> other things. Your your um, ideas around uh, development of racism brought up um, this uh, interview with Paul Gearwory where he talks about um, 
I just had it pulled up and now I can't remember, but it was about uh, racism, creating race, race instead of the opposite way around, like um, the systems. So exactly what you said. So as I was thinking about you, you also brought up the idea of um, like these these tools, I think, like like these tools that, you know, we see happening all the time. And so um, I've talked about the idea of deracializing things before when like really taking the idea uh, of race outside of the conversation when it really, really should be central. And so when I when I saw the question about um, what role does art education perpetuate, what how does art education perpetuate anti-blackness um, and or white supremacist systems, I thought about the the um, strategy, the tactic of deracializing the arts. Um, so this deracialized discourse is when race uh, is not explicitly deployed um, as a, a frame to to consider uh, the events, especially, um, it, well, mo- most situations do, do include race. So I'm not, I'm not gonna even qualify um, when that actually should not be happening. Um, but deracializing refers to the denial of the role of race in oppression. The consequences of this redirection are erasure of issues of power and subordination associated with racial designations. This means there is no questioning of status quo or racialized inequities. So, for example, um, when you think about art, arts uh, opportunities or experiences that are available to minority students, um, these can easily be discarded as uh, um, instances of economic equ- economic equity, um, but without. Um, and, and without actually acknowledging that uh, race intersects with with economics. Um, so that's, that, those are the kind of manipulations that happen oftentimes in, in the arts. Um, so like we still have art educators today negating the fact that art has historically been, been, um, and still visually mediated. Race is visually mediated. There are visual codes and conventions of racial iconography that are recycled on a day-to-day basis in popular culture, um, on social media. They contribute to these fabrications of racial differences and the maintenance of hierarchies and the normalization of white supremacist ideology. Um, the racial deracialization in arts education discourses silences the fact that race and racism impact things like art teacher identity. I mean, if you just Google art teacher, which I did and I was going to put on a slide, but it was just uh, kind of triggering, actually. Um, you can see how many people of color populate in that image list. We've we've heard this uh, this thing before, like Google artists and see what comes up. Um, Deracialization allows our educators to ignore power sustaining systems like culturally negligent standardized tests, which uh, my colleague Dr. Cray has written about, um, hegemonic art curriculum, like um, Dr. Rowling already mentioned. And even conceptions of the art canon and the textbooks we use um, by these capitalist corporations that help secure white property and white knowledge. It um, deracialization happens not only in lack of knowledge about the relationship between race and images, it actually happens through the discourse as well. So um, discourse is a system through which power circulates. Therefore, deracializing art education discourses, which are invested in whiteness in, in general, is an attempt, per, in a, an attempt to protect arts education and thus arts as white property. Um, Dr. Charbriand Plummer and I wrote a book chapter um, titled Artifacts of Resistance, and we scratched out resistance and put existence. So Artifacts of Existence, a Black Feminist Material Culture. It'll be published soon um, in uh, Anita Center and Dustin Garnett's, their book, Art Hist- Artwork Histories. Um, in it, though, I want to point out that we refer, we refer to Howard Dina Pendel's article, um, Art World and Racism, where she describes an incident where an organ- organizational group of non-white artists called Pests, um, they hung posters around New York City that read um, this. This was the statistic. There are 11,000 artists of color in New York. Why don't you see us? 
And someone um, seeing the poster, likely a stranger, responded to pests, uh, the pests, that group, the non, um, the non white artist group, responded to, to that poster by writing on it um, because you do poor work. They wrote that on the poster. So she went on to explain how language like choice, taste, quality, work to make racism invisible, work to de-racialize uh, arts in the art world. This language functioned just how it was intended to function, which was to perpetuate the objecthood of Black artists and their work, relegating them to the margins and excluding them altogether. So that's another reason why um, in my Afrofuturism article, I made a point to point out the use of language as a key aspect of supporting Black existence in the arts, because language is coded. That's why we all knew what Make America Great Again meant, um, regardless of whether or not it mentioned race. We knew what it meant and we knew what it looked like. Um, and so this pervasiveness... Um, Amelia Cray and I, um, we, we also did, we write a lot together. We're, <laughs> we're very close um, uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, we did a podcast in which we described, it's called the AHA moment. Um, it was for CAA podcast. And we described the pervasiveness of race and the ways that it, uh, race is visually mediated. And we talked about how we, we um, learned about race and racism in the world through reading the world and not like this sit down um, talk with our parents. To deny the embedded nature of race in any social experience, especially ones carried by imagery here in the U.S. is dangerous and will continue to perpetuate anti-Blackness and white supremacy. So um, the, the use of deracialization um, is this tool of whiteness that has consistently happened and allowed people to continue to create uh, um, situations where, you know, there are skills-based um, emphasis versus, and, and not seeing how um, hier hierarchies exist within the identification of skills, um, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you both so much, Dr. Rowling. I said Rowling again earlier, <laughs> please forgive me. And thank you, Dr. Boyd Aka. And I started to wear one of my sweatshirts too, but I was like, I'm gonna be fancy for my, my guest. <laughs> you guys look great. Okay, our next question. I am writing so many notes. I'm so, this is fantastic. Thank you all. So the third question, how can art educators engage in anti-racist art pedagogy? at the K-12 level and at the higher education level? Look, let's start with this notion. Uh, obviously, there's there are different definitions of what art is, right? So, and depending on how, how you define art, that's going to inform how you teach art and what you consider to be the elements of art or art making. Um, so, you know, some folks, for example, view the artistic practice or artistic process as formative, making beautiful objects in the world, um, mastering techniques and so on and so forth. And that's valid. Um, others view the uh, artistic process as not formative, but informative, um, uh, a form of communication communicating cultural values, personal identity, lived experiences, um, and that's valid um, because people practice their art making that way. And then there are those who uh, see the arts uh, and the arts process as transformative, um, a sort of a critical activist uh, approach uh, to the world, asking questions that need to be asked, uh, disrupting the status quo, especially when the status quo is unjust. Um, uh, once again, uh, asking how do we solve a problem as opposed to just simply observing the problem. Um, and that's valid because there are artists, like I say, who um, who practice one, uh, uh, one form or another. And uh, so the, uh, from my point of view, I, I, I like the idea of being able to be improvisatory and braid uh, one's way through these different approaches to art making. Um, 
And I did that as a K through 12 educator myself, as an elementary school educator myself. Uh, uh, and I'd probably skew more towards the idea of the arts as agency, but I'm gonna take it a, a step further. Um, there's this uh, artist, a German artist, Joseph Beuys, um, who's well known because of this idea of social sculpture that he made prevalent. And he defined that as a, an artwork that takes place in the social realm. Um, well-known mo modern artist, um, requiring communal, communal engagement and audience participation, ultimately leading to a transformation of society through the release of popular creativity. As I said, I've taught art at all levels, um, uh, from elementary school to the university. And I've actually always looked at, um, because I have this sort of like more global look at how do we make these different approaches to, to making art, these def different definitions of art and make use of all of them. Um, I have always viewed and practiced art education um, as a form of creativity education. Um, and it's a part of my own personal mission uh, towards the developing new creative leaders and uh, leadership development. Um, and um, I'm gonna just give you a definition if I can, uh, I've defined creative leadership as a catalyst for a collective achievement and its social consequence, human development. Um, the collective self-organizing and adaptive human behavior that we call creativity is a social form of intelligence, allowing us to connect, relate, and pool our limited resources so that we are all less alone, less vulnerable, and more able. And the work of creative leadership, stories matter. And that comes back to the, something that's always been a part of what I think is available to us as arts educators. Whether we're speaking of stories of identity or stories of possibility, the power of our creations to turn our what ifs into why nots makes works of Afrofuturism and anti-racism equally compelling. They do the same work essentially, is what I'm getting at. Um, and uh, uh, a couple of other points before I pass it back. Um, that uh, something that uh, uh, Dr. Boyd Acuff mentioned, um, and I sort of want to touch on that a little bit, um, the idea of what that process can look like when we are when we get to that place of of um, having a critical eye and understanding that the scripts that are passed along to us, the stories that are passed along to us, um, even if they're injurious, we have this agency as creators to recode, uh, decode, first of all, what is it these stories are saying to us and then recode them, um, um, change them into something else. Um, uh, this this idea of, um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit in a bit, and I, you saw one of my slides uh, in advance, so I was gonna make an analogy. I'm sort of a popular culture geek. Um, and make an analogy to a, a TV show that ran for quite some time, which was called Stargate SG-1. Um, and one of the articles that I, I wrote with my colleague, Dr. Bay, had to do with the idea of these narrative portals as Stargates, allowing for this work to be done, this particular work of reconstructing and reconfiguring um, uh, situated narratives, um, oppositional narratives, uh, uh, and turning them into relational co narrative corridors um, through sometimes oppressive circumstances. And I make the argument, and uh, I've highlighted here, that the art room or the art studio is a natural laboratory for decoding and recoding identity. That identity is one of the elements of art. And that decoding and recoding is one of the principles of design. And I'll stop there. All right, so thank you for that. Um, so how can art K-12 educators engage in anti-racist art pedagogy? Um, and so this work um, or th these ideas um, have are things that I have uh, developed conversations around with Dr. Cray when we as we were writing this this book, um, which has been a very wonderful experience, um, but also can be very triggering and, um, you know, take up a lot of energy. 
Um, but I say that to say we we're, we're really invested in these ideas about um, visual literacy plus racial literacy. And I've mentioned racial literacy um, a few times already, but I just wanted to be very explicit about what this is and what um, and how um, future art educators or our educators in general can um should engage with this type of work. So as critical race theorist Lani Gunier defines it, racial literacy is the capacity to conjugate the grammar of race in different contexts and circumstances. It's sometimes a, viril a virulent subtext at other times a nuanced dynamic, but always the meaning of race needs to be interrogated and conjugated carefully in light of relevant local circumstances and their historic underpinnings. So as art educators and artists, we know how to, we have visual literacy, we know how to read images. Um, do we know how to read racial events? Do we know how to read racial incidences? Um, and this ability to read um, is critical in order to do Afrofuturist work, to do anti-racist work. So the visual literacy in, in combination with the racial literacy allows us to merge the visual and see how the visual and the racial have a relationship. Um, to support students in conjugating the grammars of race enables thought and dialogue, particularly among students who have very little experience in race talk. Um, as if we think about our populations of students in our classrooms, um, and I'm sorry if you hear screaming, that's, those are my kids, because um, I'm at home like everyone else. Sorry. <laughs> um, if you think about um, the, the a, a level of uh, racial literacy amongst different demographics, you'll see um, the capacity for some groups to be able to identify where race is central in an event. And that depends on their lived experiences, which most of the times are in these racialized bodies that are black and brown. I mean, white bodies are also racialized, but they aren't normative. Like we don't, that's not normal for us to think about them in that way. Um, so um, ha developing racial literacy in a classroom um, is important because you never you never know if students have that foundational way way of um, identifying when race is central in an in an experience. So, um, as our educators, we can help students identify and reflect on how their beliefs about the world are conceived, but also continually mediated by visualizations of race in media, popular culture, and even on the playground. Um, uh, so Lawrence Bloom in, wrote a chapter in Micah Pollock's book, Everyday Anti-Racism, and it's called Race, Racial Incidents as Teachable Moments. And so um, how, how do we use these, how do we use racial incidents as teachable moments? How do, how do we use the insurrection? How do we use COVID? Did we do that? Um, did we see it as something that... Um, artists and our educators can intersect with. If not, that's problematic. That is the, that is the disconnect between um, racial literacy and visual literacy. We saw all of these things happen. We saw people climbing up a wall, you know, on, t on the TV screen. And this is not outside of our, um, our students' purview. So um, those are the kinds of that's the very the ways very explicitly how racial literacy is critical in um, this type of work. And I wanted to um, share also um, a couple of actual artists um, because when you think about racial literacy, if you if you just jump to Afrofuturist artists, right? Do you you don't have the language? You you there are some very foundational um, ways of seeing and interpreting things that racial literacy provides you that you wouldn't be able to engage in this. So you can't just if you're on this um, webinar and you think like, oh, well, I'm going to introduce some, um, you know, Afrofuturist artists. Um, how are you? Are you? Will you not do them harm? Will you not? Will you not um, further trigger your students by? Um, representing people, representing ideas and um, things in very um, stereotypical ways or um, uh, homogenous, um, just problematic. Um, 
But I wanted to show you this uh, link. I hope this goes to, all right, so this. This put a spell on you. Cause you're mine. Do, 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 do. I just wanted to share it again um but this artist is uh Sab some Sinbaj Banjo um and he is a artist a Nigerian artist he became kind of popular when Beyonce used him in, in her Lemonade visual album um but he he uses um Yoruba mythology in his work and so um most of his art is about his childhood memories. Amp and that this is an example of amplifying the past future, future visions that, that after futurism talks about. He, he asks, what if we walked around like gods and goddesses of Yoruba mythology? Um, these artworks are rooted in techniques and traditions, traditions of the diaspora, but are resolutely forward looking. So I'll, I'll show this to, to um, demonstrate an example of um, the there's a there's a need for uh, racial literacy to be able to unpack and know what next step to do to introduce this artist. In addition to um, you all may know Wangechi Mutu's work, who um, this particular piece is um, a representation of two cyborg mutants meshed together with these anthropological, ethnographic, medical, fashion, and pornographic images, and they are. Um, um, heroines of the future. She says that I'm really trying to pay homage homage to the notion of the sublime and the abject together and using this, the aesthetic of rejection or poverty or wretchedness as a tool to talk about the things that are transcendent and hopeful. Um, we really have to pick up pieces and remake the, the remake and rework things to translate them into something new and hopeful. And then this last work, which is this is was a master student here at Ohio State. Um, and I just want to amplify his work because those other two artists they're on a on a larger level, but Jamel's work is um so explosive. So um his work called Congo Square is here and it's a 3D model. He works with um, he works with VR. And so I saw a question in the chat about how you can introduce this to um, to high schoolers, middle schoolers. And um, it's through these kind of artworks, you can manipulate, go around this whole situation here. And you can click on certain artifacts in it and it'll take you to that specific artifact. And I can put his link in the chat to um, just for to give you uh, resources, but again, I want to emphasize engaging in this type of work right here. If you look at that on the face, it's really easy to just place that in the um, realm of Africa as history. You know, Africa as uh, this mask making, Africa as this very um, homogenous, con one whole continent, not separating it in its, in its variances and its uh, multiplicity. So, um, but without that racial literacy, you just can't do it. So um, you can't jump to Afrofuturist art. You have, there's some foundational things as art educators that we have to have before we can even get to um, locating our, our self in, in, the, in our discourse in this, in this frame. Do you mind if I ask you quickly, when you say that an art teacher would need foundational, what, what are the foundational things they would need to begin this kind of work? So like the, the language, just, just take the language, for example. Um, if, you, if you apply um, uh, 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 language around master or language around um, these quality indicators that aren't existent in 
other countries or in this in this realm where we want to flatten the hierarchy um, within within the U S how the U S is is created um that's foundational before you can you can't apply our pr principles and concepts to these afrofuturist um examinations in, in, of the arts like we can't um in in that case then we we can then go to what howard howardina pendale talked about as far as like um you know the separatism and like this is good for this group this is good enough for black artists, um, but it doesn't fit into our um, the quality or the style or the um, what we like to see as fine art. So that even just that language, that those are the foundational things that I'm talking about, even from media, um, you know, thinking about which which ways of creating are. Um, are you placing on a pedestal? Mm -hmm. Um, and, in in that way, when, if you saw an artwork on a body, <laughs> um, you may think of it as like some kind of kitsch or something like that. You know, it may, it may not be, um, on your radar as something to introduce to your student as a very important piece of work to elevate and amplify in your classroom. So without, without noting that you are assigned, like you utilize operationalizing these white supremacist ideas on, um, uh, specific works, then you, did that, did that clarify? Yes. Thank okay. you so much. Sorry to ask a question. It wasn't already. No Thank you so much. No, I think that I think Kathy, that's a great that's a great follow up question. I was just going to um, add what I hear you saying, Joni, is that it's the ability to make the connections, right? So we can't make those connections unless we have that prior knowledge of the cultural histories, the, um, the even the cultural art histories that are inherent, like the you know what you're saying, bringing the visual and the racial together isn't something based on what you're saying I, what I'm hearing is you're saying this isn't something that's automatically going to happen and we can't assume that students just know all of that history and seeing that and that's the the value and the importance of that so yeah yeah I'm, I'm feeling that <laughs> for sure um with that I think that leads perfectly to our last guiding question and then we'll end up opening this up to our Q&A um, that based on your scholarship, um, pedagogy and positions in the field, how do you foresee the future of our education as being anti-racist, um, anti-racist institution and or discipline? So how can that happen? It feels like a lot <laughs> to ask, but, you know, you all are the best ones that would know that that question. Yes, uh, and thank you for, for that question. And I'm going to, uh, in concluding the, with this last question, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, so I'm going to go back to that series that I mentioned, um, uh, the sci-fi TV series, Stargate SG-1. Um, in it, these portals, these alien, ancient alien devices called Stargates were allowed, um, they, they, these things allowed like into instant interstellar travel um, and served as a mediating portal between our earthbound realities and parallel worlds that are out there. These are the universes. Um, there's this definition that's useful for us. Um, this word alignment, which is where we get the term liminality from. Um, this is defined, especially when you're talking about transgressive pedagogies, as a threshold, a border, a neutral zone between ideas, cultures, or territories that one must cross to get over from one side to the other. So once again, thinking big picture in terms of what Afrofuturism allows us to do, what anti-racism allows us to do, um, allows these mediating liminalities, these points of access, like gateways, which are also points of intervention, uh, crucial thresholds uh, that um, enable us, uh, enable resistance to past um, interpretations of identity, um, misinterpretations of identity and culture, uh, 
So I'm um, getting at this idea that Afrofuturism generates these kinds of points of access, these, these interventions into story genres, which have otherwise excluded our presence. Stories that might've been science fiction, superheroes, horror stories. We can talk about Get Out as a, as a work of, of uh, Afrofuturism. If when you, once again, when you open up that definition, right? Not just think about it as um, uh, in, in, in the most, uh, the most typical uh, uh, versions of what we see. Um, it goes beyond that. So I'm going to go back also to the idea that um, uh, um, systems thinking, once again, Danella Meadows, um, she talks about how you change structures, how you change systems, remembering that systems resist change. They want to maintain their systemic nature, their identity. Um, all systems resist and they, they, they try to maintain an equilibrium. They resist change. Um, so then uh, where do we go from here? Um, what kind of interventions are possible? Well, one of the things that uh, Danella Meadows did was she uh, created a, a list of about 12 different um, uh, points of intervention and in systems that go from um, uh, ha the likely to have the lesser at impact to a more to the at the at the, its height most likely to have a, a permanent and long lasting impact um, and that's what I, what I want to get at here um, especially when we look at once again this melding this mapping over of this idea of Afrofuturism -futur and anti-racism the co-opting of stories as points of access to altering those stories, expanding those stories. So um, one of the things, uh, it was gonna break, I'm gonna do this in very simply though. I'm not gonna talk about all 12 points of intervention. I'm gonna talk about four territories or areas of intervention. Um, so one is this idea of altering parameters. Uh, so for example, and, I, and I've put this up on the screen, um, you can change a system that treats black lives like they don't matter in several ways. You can change at the very least, alter the parameters that mark the boundaries of the prevailing system, allowing it to diverge from its prior limits. So for example, I'm gonna go back to that film I mentioned, um, The Girl with All the Gifts. Um, you can widen the scope of genres such as science fiction or superhero action movies or horror films or zombie apocalypse literature so that they now include stories of BIPOC lives, black and indigenous persons of color that were once ex excluded or once peripheralized in such stories. Um, uh, an example, uh, you know, I, I was looking, there's some, some graphic novels which are coming out, Hard, hard Ears, um, said a, a, myth, a, mythologic, a mythical version of Barbados uh, is among the titles coming out from a particular um, publisher called Megascope. Um, uh, uh, once again, playing with certain stories, which, uh, and expanding, expanding them, expanding the parameters of what those stories typically talk about. Here's another one, Black Star, a cat and mouse tale, two astronauts stranded on a desolate planet, comes out in May. Um, once again, expanding the stories of uh, astronauts out in space to include the lives of persons of color. Because once you get past the what ifs, you, you, you enter the realm of why not? Why not, right? Um, Another way of looking at this is um, altering feedback. You can alter the, uh, the way a racist system identifies or, or selects um, individuals uh, or institutions uh, uh, and elements that constitute it. It selects how it acts upon them. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to, yeah. So, so, so take your art room, take your art studio, take your museum and think about it as a ready instrument for responding to social environmental needs, um, or perhaps as a sanctum for the careful observation of uh, the human condition um, uh, as it resists stereotyped and superficial media propaganda or conspiracy theories or the lies that we see in coming out of politics these days. Um, altering that feedback allows for, once again, uh, a changing of the uh, equilibrium, the status quo. Um, another thing that Danella uh, uh, Meadows gets at is the idea of altering the design of, um, of a system. Um, so like, for example, you can take a, a racist system that and turn it so that it acts upon itself. 
so uh, defies its own setting, so to speak, um, and, and and the efficiency with which it uh, replicates itself, because systems tend to reproduce themselves, right? Um, and so, for example, um, uh, you can take a, a discourse that typically creates a, 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 a visceral reaction, uh, a stereotype that creates a visceral reaction, and you can turn it on its head by speaking so, speaking something different through that same discourse. So, you know, we know the history of um, stereotypes of um, persons of color in the United States is ugly, injurious. It's meant to, it was meant to harm. It was meant to kill the spirit. And yet you have um, artists like Carrie James Marshall taking those tropes and turning them into different kinds of stories, stories that speak differently. Uh, artists like Michael Ray Charles taking stories that were once ensconced in ugliness and making them turn and speak something different. Uh, finally, um, uh, you can alter the intent uh, of a racist system uh, so that it achieves a to and totally different output or a totally different outcome than it does at present. Um, so you can turn your art room or your art studio or your music uh, museum or your collective and turn it into a platform for telling public stories of lived experiences, lived experiences, not caricatured experiences, not stereotyped experiences, not cartoon experiences, but lived experiences um, that, uh, that individuals live, that, that um, communities live, and stories that nobody else is in a position, a position to tell. Um, earlier in, my, uh, in your introduction of me, you, you mentioned uh, this book that I just it just came out, uh, Growing Up Ugly. Um, and it's meant to talk about the fact that there's a, uh, sometimes there are certain stereotype notions of what the life of a black child is like. By writing this memoir, my goal was to sort of like say, well, no, my life was full of daydreams in the midst of thinking that and being presented with the evidence that I was an ugly and unwanted individual in terms of my upbringing. Um, yet and still there was a whole other inner life that that was there that was not made, might have been overlooked simply because the story says that this is not what black boys are thinking about. Um, but so, but once again, by putting the story out there and throwing it back out into the popular culture, I'm able to sort of like contest, well, what what is it like to grow up as a black boy daydreaming? Um, so uh, ultimately, um, I. I look at the future of Afro um, futuristic um, anti-racist work as this uh, generator for these kinds of interventions, these retelling of stories, these co-opting of stories. Uh, and our effort uh, as um, artists and art educators is to then find the platform that allows us to, to help uh, learners to have that facility um, of co-opting stories and turning them into something different um, and recognizing that these principles, that these tools, that these exercises that you can learn and, and look at through um, the Afrofuturistic lens, they're available to us. They're common. Um, we can take ownership over them. They're not um, uh, something that we cannot um, take agency over. They're theirs for the taking, right? Um, and so let me stop there. All right, so for this last question, I don't have a slide, but um, honestly, I, when I read the question, um, I thought about the, I think it was on HBO, the, the series Little Fires Everywhere. Um, it was a, it's based off a book. And so um, I see our future being anti-racist through creating those little fires everywhere. Because at the institutional level, um, you know, our sphere of influence is not is not really that there um, when it comes to, well, for teachers in a classroom, you know? Um, and so how can we uh, foster and support and encourage uh, teachers, practicing teachers to build their own fires by building teacher collectives um, on the ground level in these, in the, in regions, in, in cities, in, in, um, in states. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm a part of a collective right now um, where we've staged certain interventions um, quietly 
throughout uh, the field um, and no one knows about them. Um, but we've seen we've seen the fruits of them. And so we also we have to also be get not be caught up on what um being praised for this work, like it, it has to also happen quietly. You know, you have to be, want to do it because it's important to do. And so that's the only way the fires will be sustained as well is if they are genuine and they are grounded in loving students, loving humans in general and, uh, and falling into your role as an educator. If you don't love all humans, you should not be teaching anybody's kid. And so these, um, you know, as a, as an artist, as an, um, teacher educator too, I'm thinking about how am I, um, articulating this kind of collective building in my teacher ed program, like in, in, in certain classes, am I talking to them about the ways that certain collectives, arts collectives have moved and created interventions? Um, because this work is so daunting um, that it can it can create so much fear that it is uh, debilitating, and so um, when you think about creating a small fire, it's more it's it's more attainable for our students. So I I think about um, yeah, just just spreading spreading the fires, and as, as all the small fires come, you know, one whoosh will come eventually at some point. Um, so that's how. That's how I see it possibly happening, but it has to be um, from a place of really love and care and healing for um, the spirit of your students. Thank you so much for your wise, <laughs> learned answers. Like I said, we've all been taking so many notes. We're gonna go ahead and move to the chat. And I know I was gonna ask a follow-up a question for Dr. Rowling about when he said that um, Afrofuturism and anti-racist pedagogy do the same work, but you kind of answered that when you talked about how they're telling the story and how that in turn is altering systems. And so thank you for, for answering the question before I can even ask. So we're gonna go ahead and move to the chat. And Lauren, did you want to ask the questions for the chat or shall I? You can go ahead and, and start if you saw yes. some questions already. All right, someone asked early on, um, what was your first experience of anti-Black racism and have you ever experienced it? Also, what was going on inside your mind when it was happening? So uh, I could talk, you, you, it's, you, I could talk about most memorable, but you, you asked very specifically, what was my first? Um, so that takes me way back. <laughs> uh, so I went to, uh, I was bust. Um, uh, from my neighborhood to an all white neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York, um, at, out of my parents' effort to, to get me a better schooling that was available in my, my neighborhood. As a matter of fact, there was a school on my street, um, PS 52, I'm sorry, um, PS 167 um, in Crown Heights, um, Eastern Parkway uh, and uh, Schenectady. Um, that would have been my zoned elementary school, except that my parents felt that the, um, they wanted us to to have a, uh, the quality that was available to kids in other neighborhoods. And so they bust me to Sheepshead Bay. Um, and so on uh, those, uh, because I was like one of a handful of um, students um, who were not from the neighborhood, didn't really belong. Um, one of these things is not like the other, that kind of thing, Sesame Street. Um, I sort of got bombarded with um, um, incidents uh, in elementary school and I withdrew um, mentally. I had to check out in some cases. Um, I think one that was most interesting to me was the, um, the and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll pass it back to Joni, is something that would happen typically on my school bus Simply because, um, you know, the, the way that the seats were designed, you could peek over them. And every once in a while, I'd have kids who, um, specifically a kid named Thomas, who liked to um, put his hands all on my head, right? Because my hair was different. Um, and he was sort of objectifying my, my, phys my you know, f character, physical characteristics. 
Um, he didn't ask for permission. He, it was like his playground. Um, I had an interesting reaction to that kind of invasion of personal space um, because I was different, right? Um, uh, in the sense that I, I allowed it um, because strangely enough, in a, in a situation where there wasn't a lot of contact and connection with students, with other students who didn't see me as one of them, um, that was at least some contact. It was at least something. And as a first grader or second grader, I allowed it, um, even though it messed up my hair <laughs> for the rest of the day, right? Um, and so, um, and I wanna take care uh, to, to contextualize that as not being um, so much anti-Black racism as a, a moment of being othered, um, which falls in the same realm it wasn't visceral, it wasn't angry, it wasn't malicious. It was um, that um, that realm where folks don't recognize that my boundaries are their boundaries. They would have been upset if I messed up their hair that they had combed all um, before they went to school that morning. They didn't give me the same um, uh, grace. Um, so, but that's, those are the things that stick with me but I have a lot of those that I could talk about them and some of them are in my memoir, as a matter of fact, but I'll leave it there. Well, I'll, I'll say that it's interesting that both of our experiences are situated around a school and educational experience, um, which is even more evidence that um, these conversations are necessary in our classrooms. Um, so I don't, I can't tell you the first incident. But I'll tell you the um, one that has was brought up um, that came up through me um, just fairly recently, um, and it respond. It, it's a, a reflection on um, my educational experience, and I've told this story a couple of times. But um, I live in Stark. I, I'm from Starkville, Mississippi, and um, unlike these larger cities in these bigger states, um, we don't have, um, we didn't have multiple school schools at different levels. Like there was one kindergarten, one first grade, one second grade, everybody in that town went to the same school through 12th grade. Um, and so not the same school building, but the same, you know, everybody went to the same building, um, same school. Um, but there was a school there called Starkville Academy, and everybody knew that that was the school that the white kids from this very specific neighborhood went to. It was a private school, and it was K through 12, and it was about probably like 70, 80 people um, at the time. And so that school was adjacent to my high school, and I had to ride past that that school every single day to get to high school. And every single day I looked at that school and was like, you know, like you don't want, and it was known around town, like these these white families don't want to be in the school with black, with black kids. And so that was, I mean, it wasn't like an explicit somebody coming, calling me a, uh, uh, bad name. It was a microaggression, environmental microaggression, micro insult that I had to experience every single day I went through ninth through 12th grade. I mean, I knew it was there, but it was right next to our high school. And so just, you know, possibly being triggered every day um, of my high school experience. Um, and so that that is the most memorable that sticks out to me as very explicitly anti-black um and uh long term like these things have long-term impact for me to just now like really be able to unpack that feeling that I had going by that school every day um you know and that also speaks to my lack of racial literacy too like I didn't even have the language to to identify that as a racial event I didn't have that until I started to be able to to, um, to use that racial, my racial consciousness in a way to 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 make 
decisions and theorize around this stuff. And so when I went to Penn State as an undergrad um, and I experienced very explicit racism, I was like, well, this is more racism than I experienced back at home in Mississippi. But no, not really. I'm just lear- I'm just learning the difference, the, the range of implicit versus explicit, conscious versus unconscious, micro versus macro. And so, um, yeah, that's my experience. Actually, we have some more excellent questions. We're nearing our time where we're officially supposed to close. I don't know if our colleagues, um, our two panelists can stay after for a few minutes and answer more questions. If they can, then we will close out now and then anybody that can stay, we can answer some additional questions. Well, thank you everyone for coming. We so appreciate uh, you joining us. We had such a, a, a wonderful virtual audience today. Um, and I, I hope that you feel that you learned a lot today. I saw a lot of comments and the Q&A where people were saying thank you. Um, and so we just want to thank Dr. Rowland and Dr. Boy Akoff for being with us today. We've learned, I know I've learned so much from you all today. And uh, we hope that you'll come back on March the 12th um, to hear our discussion on anti-racism in um, design. I'd also like to thank the artist too, Augustine Azur. I hope I'm saying his name correctly, who drew our, the image that is is a part of the, the iconography for the series, as well as the Onstead Institute. So thank yes, you all. I was going to say the, the Onstead Institute, the College of Visual Arts and Design, and all of our wonderful co-sponsors okay. that su- have supported us. I know that we have a lot of um, our supporters on the call today. So thank you, thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. So for those of you who can stay, we're going to pick a few more questions and we're going to continue the conversation. And thank you so much for being willing to stay a little after to our panelists. Did you see a question that you wanted to ask, Lauren? Or because I see a one right there, but you go ahead as you see one. Yes, I do. So this is a question about leadership. And I think even though the question is centered in school districts. I think that we could easily expand it out to talk about higher ed leadership too. Um, But it says, how can art ed leadership and school districts get up to speed with anti-racist pedagogy and make sure teachers in turn get up to speed? It is not acceptable for art ed to continue to center around white European art from the 1800s or treating art traditions of black and brown artists as trivial as often as it does. So um, it seems as though like we're speaking here about like what can leaders, art leaders do um, to ensure that we're doing, that the rest of us are doing a part as teachers. Yeah, I'd like to start off on this one, if, if, if I may, because it was just last night on a on a, um, a Zoom call with a, with a commission that I helped to assemble. Um, it's the, um, through the National Art Education Association, um, we now have a um, uh, an equity, diversity, and inclusion commission. It's been in existence um, since um, December of uh, 2019. Of course, 2020 was a was a strange year for everybody in the world. Um, uh, but this has been a very productive group even so far. Um, and um, the reason why I raise it is because part of the work that we're doing is attempting to create, um, uh, it was for short, we call it the EDNI Commission. If you go to the, the National Education Association website, um, NAEA, um, uh, as a matter of fact, if you sign up for the, the, the NAEA convention, which is coming up at the uh, first week of March, um, you'll find a lot of resources that are being that are made available by the EDI Commission, EDI Commission, EDI Commissioners. But the key part of it is the fact that this work is not a top-down kind of work; it's a bottom-up kind of work. Um, and so, one of the things that we are looking to do is to be a catalyst for state organizations, because every state has its own art teacher association, um, to begin their own, to start their own EDI commissions, and to start the work that work. And what we've been trying to do is develop resources, toolkits. Um, tip sheets, um, which are all coming online and becoming available, if not already available through NAEA's website that will help facilitate local, uh, local EDNI field workers, I call them, um, folks who are committed to this work um, uh, with tools, 
um, that will help to get them started. As a matter of fact, there are state organizations which have traditionally not felt very equipped because of uh, because of the constitution of their their membership, um, not having many um, persons of color involved. But yet we we argue that no, you have there are tools, there are interventions that you can begin. Um, uh, and there are tools that are available, and the goal is to get those tools in the hands of local of uh, uh, school districts, school schools, museums, um, and to and to be a catalyst for the work bubbling up, right? Um, for stories being written from the bottom up, right? Um, so I'll say that to um, uh, so look out for the information and get connected, um, and if nothing else. Make yourself as a state organization or a local organization or a school district looking for materials and reach out to us. Um, my email address is um, uh, jrolling at arteducators.org. That's for NAEA. Um, uh, you can also reach me at Syracuse University, jrolling at syr.edu. Um, even though I, I'll be stepping out of my role as chair of that com uh, commission in a couple of months, um, I'll pass that information along. We are keeping a database of folks who are looking for for um, um, tools and resources, and we're looking to help folks get equipped with. And mind you, we're not the only organization doing it. What part of what we're trying to do is to be a hub for some of the other anti-racist organizations that are out there that are also doing the work, and just making sure we stay connected, right? Because they many other wonderful resources are being produced by other organizations already. Right. So uh, let me stop there. I don't have anything to add to that. James got all the leadership. He got all of it. <laughs> I trust everything that he says. <laughs> Actually, there was two questions by Sarah Mason and one by sh my student, Sherry Avasi. I hope she's still here. But um, did you want to did you see those, Lauren? I think this is tying into what Joni talked about. And she said she would love to hear more about what is involved in quiet intervention. I can't, I, I'm not gonna say what our interventions have been because they, um, because if we plan, we can't divulge our, our moves, you know, if we plan to ever do them again. Um, but I think they were, Quiet, quiet interventions are um, situated, um, I feel like, in, in, in our, our group. And I, when I talk about the, the collective, I'm talking about CREATE, which is the um, Coalition for uh, Race and Equity, Racial Equity on in Arts and Education. Um, and so... Quiet interventions are situated around an ethics of care for us. And so a quiet intervention may be, and I'll say this is an ongoing intervention for us, is to support as our our collective is a is a is a collective of um, artists, activists, scholars of color. And so to support one another emotionally as well as professionally. And that is an intervention because the retention of faculty and teachers of color um, is situated around mental health and um, burnout. And so that has been a quiet intervention, our support of one another, um, not highlighted in an article, not highlighted um, in a presentation, but something that sustains the work, you know, and it's, and it's, um, and it's not, situated around what I have to get for tenure. It's not situated around what I have to do for my professional leadership and organizations. It's literally situated around just us sustaining ourselves as people of color. And so that has been, that's an example of one of the quiet interventions that we've done um, because no one, no one cares at this point if, if they don't see us anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm sure other students of color would care because they have they have sought us out to be mentors. But no, we have had to b develop this foundation for ourselves to continue the work. And that has been one of the quiet interventions that we've done. And I'm going to add real quickly that um, ever since I did that open letter last summer, I've been actually quietly developing and refining 
the 12 interventions or points of intervention, uh, leverage points, points of intervention point uh, in, in, uh, to, you know, to, uh, uh, to counteract a resistant um, system uh, that, that works against, uh, um, you know, change, works against being changed. Um, those things that, um, uh, you know, racism uh, institutionalized, um, but there are there are there are interventions that are available, and I frankly have been I'm at this place where I am thinking about developing some kind of online coursework. I don't know if I want to do it through Syracuse University or if I want to do it through NAEA or if I want to do it independently. But I do know that the work has been fruitful enough. I've gotten such feedback about it since then um, that I know that that uh, if if given the scaffolding. Um, and and given the license to now adapt it, take it, adapt it, make it your own, that a lot of good work can be done. The question is not, I mean, my, my, my uh, dilemma is to, is, to, is to figure out what's the best way to de deliver that um, beyond the letter, right? Um, because like I said, I've, def I've, I've refined it since then. And I'm, uh, I'm using it in my own coursework here that I teach, but I wanted to get it out to the public as well. So um, that's a, that's a, that's a a quiet intervention meant to once again be catalyst for other people's interventions. Thank you both for that. You know, what I wanted to ask a follow up question, and it really kind of goes into a lot of what you both were saying about um, Joni. You talked about that emotional labor and the mm -hmm. burnout, um, and I love the resources you're bringing to the surface. Um, I think one of the questions that I have, um, I didn't see it in the chat, but I just kind of feel that I need to ask the question. Um, like, how do we facilitate these opportunities for that kind of those quiet interventions? Um, because I, I, I get the sense a lot of times that whether it's faculty of color, K through 12, higher ed, um, or just people who are trying to be good allies. There's just, there's such a, an emotional labor mm -hmm. and potential for burnout. Mm -hmm. um, and there's such resistance. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the, what are some of the ecosystems we can create to like better support one another? Um, it's just, it just seems like there's, there's a whole lot there, <laughs> you know, in terms of how we can, um, support each other in in this work yeah i'll just say uh that um that labor is uh, is real and uh at my university in my school of education the faculty of color which are a few um created a, a uh, our own organization within amongst the faculty because of the the needs that we were trying to address were not being addressed um the impact on us as faculty and, uh, and uh, upon our students who are students of color who are too few and also upon allies who who say, OK, this is like we're swimming against the tide here. What are we supposed to do about all of this? Um, you have to sort of almost create these. Um, these. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I tend to go pop culture references um, and for whatever reason, um, Seven of Nine from one of the Star Trek series. Um, I think it was Star Trek. Um, might have been Voyager. Could, but anyway, there was a place uh, where she would um, um, take and recharge, um, and um, and then you know, uh, she, she, I won't get into who she was, but um, those places of recharge, those spaces, safe spaces for for being ourselves, for for recharging, for supporting one another. Those are real needs <laughs> and figuring out how to do it and not feeling guilty for doing it um, because, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot, um, especially, you know, the idea of people, you know, we, we're, we're, we've, we've encountered people performing allyship, you know, you know, okay. So yes, you know, we'll put a placard up or put a bulletin up. We support black lives matter, but that's just words, not ver it's just verbiage, not real. Um, and we've, we've encountered that. Um, or that's all, that's as far as folks are willing to go. Okay, we said this. Okay, now let's move on to keep things as we've been doing it. So how do you actually create change? So anyway, um, uh, the short of it is that there's a, there's a real need to create spaces for ourselves 
to, and, and without feeling guilty about it, um, to um, maintain ourselves and to recharge ourselves and support and to fuel ourselves, um, to steer ourselves up for the next encounter. And I'll add uh, um, the emphasis on don't ask for permission to do it. Mm-hmm. Like, I think a lot of times we're waiting for our institutions to support us in ways that we need to be supported and they just don't have the tools to do that. Right. Um, and so don't ask for permission. Don't wait. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the people who I'm, I work with, it came at a time of dire need And I think our work also as a group is to support people before they get to that, uh, Black and Indigenous people of color to to, to, um, find that support beforehand. And also you have to consider about whether or not you want it to be inside or outside the institution. Like, um, you know, there are interdepartment, like, like we have a black and black women professional faculty and professional staff group in, inside OSU. That's great, but I also need something that's outside of it, not dependent on any funding from, and that has its pros and cons. So you have to also think about if you want institutional support, if you don't want institutional support, can, support do you want to in, engage in both of those types of um relationship development and relationship building. So um, I would say just, I mean, you can start with one person and you got one on the, on the call with you already. <laughs> you know, it's really about relationship building. And you, I mean, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be situated around anything that we understand a, a, a group to function as like I think our create struggled a little bit at first about thinking about what do we ha- what are we going to do what are we going to do and we realized we don't have to do anything we are doing the work by sustaining one another like stop like break away from the idea that we have to be busy to be efficient and, and effective in our work um, like we don't have to write an article about this <laughs> we can just do this <laughs> right and not tell anybody that's good that's good that's good mm-hmm. that is really good <laughs> if you don't mind we'll close out with one last question i thought was a really good one um this is a student of mine and she is a uh, east asian american young woman and so she's thinking about as a person who is not black how do you engage? And she just asked, her name is Sherry. She said, how would you tie oppressed races outside of the black narrative in discussion of Afrofuturism in K-12 classrooms? We wanna highlight black voices as, ele- as educators, excuse me, but also create a culture of belonging. Most of her students are Latinx. Yeah, I mean, th- this is to me is, 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 is fundamental about finding um, what's the basic principle underlying something and then adapting it for your own, right? Uh, this is, this is um, the idea, the, the, the fact is that there are all kinds of marginalized and other, otherized groups, um, social groups in, in a society like ours. Um, and each has its own needs and each, just like uh, uh, Johnny just said, there's no need to feel guilty about the fact that you got needs too that need to be addressed. Um, and, um, I think the, 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 where I would go is to take any principle that you think is useful, right? So like I said before that for me, Afrofuturism co-ops stories, anti-racism co-op stories, alters them, changes them. Um, that, um, what, if you're coming from a, a uh, from a, a Latinx or, 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 or um, uh, a group right now, uh, folks who are Chinese American are being assaulted by the um, the rhetoric and of the day. Um, there's like I said, there's all kinds of groups that are that are that are that are undergoing um, this um, marginalization or this effort to make them seem as if their lives don't matter quite as much as the dominant groups. Well, um, you can take the principles that another group um, has used, just like. Um, the women's rights movement used uh, principles from the civil rights movement. The disability rights movement used principles from the civil rights movements, made it their own, made gains using those 
those principles, find the principles, find the underlying principles. Um, it's not, don't get, don't get lost in the fact that, oh, this is just for that. No, you can take, borrow, adapt, adapt. That's what human beings do. We adapt, we take and we change and we make, um, make it our own. So you can do that. Um, so I just want to encourage you to do that. I mean, thinking about Latinx communities, the like Afro, the, the diaspora that's within that that group in general is also a, a something to to nurture and grow and um, dissect the complexity and nuance of of that identity as well. So um, that's all I would say. But. Thank you so much for your willingness. I know Lauren wants to say something and I wanted to mention Monica Scott. We want to thank her. She's our marketing manager. She asked that as we close, if if any those of you are still on this call, if you post about this event, if you can tag CBAT on Instagram so that we can follow your work and the work of either artists or teachers of art. And our Instagram is CBAT, UNT CBAT. So either follow us or tag us if you um, post about this event. Lauren, I'll let you close out. Well, once again, I, I think that this has been, it has enriched me. So thank you both for, for giving up your time and your knowledge and your strategies. Um, it's, I'm, I'm going to, it's going to take a minute for me to like digest <laughs> and process all that um, has been said today, but it, it's definitely very enriching. And I, I know that there are, students and teachers on the call that would get a lot from this, um, whether they were here live with us or are listening um, or viewing through the recording. So we just thank you both, Dr. Rowland and Dr. Boyd Acoff for being here with us today and just give, give your all. <laughs> we really greatly appreciate you. Thank you to Helen and Heather as well in PR. And thank you all for your comments in the comment section as well. They've given you guys some love and some positivity to Dr. Boyd Acuff and Dr. Rowling. And thank you all so much for your time, for staying after. And we will be in touch with you guys about moving forward and publishing this transcript as well. So thank you, <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank, thank you, so you much. for the invitation. Thanks, James, for being a wonderful co-panelist too. Thank you, co-panelist. <laughs> I was trying not to fan out. I was like, oh no. <laughs> I get to meet my idols. Oh, no. I've met Jody already, but I was like, I get to meet Dr. Dr. Ron. Oh, no. So I'm trying to be cool, you know, cool. But thank you all. This was lovely, lovely, lovely.